Well, I want to congratulate Daniel Weiss, who is our first, you're on the leaderboard now, Daniel. So all the rest of you will have an opportunity through uh, subsequent questions to take, it, take the leadership away from Daniel. Okay, up next, we are gonna have our first conversation on sustainable supply chains. And to host this is going to, going to be Dale Christie. Dale is blockchain strategist at FedEx, and he is also on our executive advisory board for the Blockchain Center of Excellence. A Couple of other things about Dale. Anyone in this space knows of Dale, and he is really world renowned for his argument that blockchains are a team sport, and he often uses the term coopetition. We're also excited here because he's an alum of the University of Arkansas, so he's a Razorback along with us. And one of Dale's hobbies is bike riding, and you will often find him in the world-class bike trails of Northwest Arkansas. So Dale, I'd like to invite you to the main stage. I'll pass it over to you to introduce your phenomenal panel. And when you're ready, I'll come back. I'm gonna be monitoring Q&A and uh, come back and ask your panelists some questions. Great, good morning, Mary. Um, honored, I know we all are honored to be part of this. And I uh, bring you greetings from Memphis. Um, and uh, I work for FedEx. Uh, I'm the business fellow blockchain strategist for Fe FedEx. And um, so uh, we are all over the place today on our virtual panel. But again, um, I, I've spent my entire career in transportation, um, started with Consolidated Freightways many, many years ago, which led to Conway, which led to American Freightways, which, which led to FedEx Freight. So most of my focus has been in the, what they refer to as the LTL, the less than truckload side of things. Uh, and my brain kind of connects dots. So I've done a number of things, ops and sales and all that stuff. But I really spent a lot of years in process improvement and quality uh, and strategy. And uh, that's what I was doing. I was a VP of strategic planning and support when I happened on to blockchain. And uh, we did the very first use case now several years ago, 2017. And so at this point, before we go deeper into that, um, it's my honor to uh, turn this over. You know, I had like a six page intro for Colonel Jim Regner here, but I thought it would be more efficient for all of us if he simply gave his own introduction, rather than me talking about the four Nobel prizes he's won and all the other stuff I could, you know, I could, I could add. To this. But uh, Colonel Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you would for your intro. Thanks, Dale, I appreciate it. So I'll only use five of those six pages and uh, we'll get through it, so. Uh... Um, so Jim Reganor, I spent 31 years in the Air Force flying airplanes all over the world. Um, and when I left the Air Force, or before I left the Air Force, I ran a large logistics organization, 15 uh, locations, 11 countries, three continents. And uh, we we're always starving for spare parts. So when I left the Air Force, um, I came into a, a business, Moog, uh, working there, and came across 3D printing and tried to find a way to solve those problems. Um, and what we found was blockchain trust was needed in order to allow somebody to send a part directly to where it was needed. So that's where I got into blockchain and we'll unpack a lot of that stuff as we go today. So I'll pause there and spare you all the other stuff. We'll get to it later. Thank you. Great, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, it's also my pleasure to uh, initially introduce Tom Fahey from Accenture and again, huge background in blockchain and responsibilities there. So Tom, if you'll do the same and provide us an intro, thanks. Absolutely, so been with Accenture now for 15 years, um, spent a lot of that early um, career working with consumer goods companies, trying to solve, I call it the, the planes, trains, and automobiles <laughs> problem. So trucks, warehouses, where to put them and how to move goods most efficiently across truckload, LTL, and ocean ocean networks. Um, re fairly recently got into blockchain, yeah, well, fairly recently, two years ago, um, thinking about all the different ways that, that blockchain and multi-party systems and multi-party thinking more broadly. Yeah, it's funny, Dale, I, I also use the word team sport. I actually hadn't heard that attributed to you. I don't know if I got it from you or... Um, great minds thinking alike, but I love talking about how the future of supply chains is a is a team sport, and that we absolutely need to think about ways to establish trust across those networks to um, solve problems like provenance, like authenticity, um, and all the other and risk and resilience that um, plague supply chains today. Excellent. So there's our all star panel right there, the two gentlemen that are joining me here, and uh, we're going to go back and forth here. But I'm gonna I'm gonna step up to the plate first. Uh, and try to kind of paint the picture here. I want to connect part of the FedEx journey into this topic as we set up the discussion. <clears throat> Excuse me, as I briefly mentioned a second ago, 
Uh, the first FedEx use case was back in 2017. I'm not going to go deep into this. I just want to kind of foundationally set this up. It was a three-party scenario. Um, I, I call that out because what we're talking about is insanely complex by comparison to that, and yet our first use case of three parties was, was sufficiently complex. Um, but in this case, we're going to get to dozens and hundreds of, of, of moving parts within these supply chains. So the three-party scenario, receiver, shipper, carrier, we weren't connecting. We were talking past each other. We were using different languages. The receiver would order something on a purchase order from the shipper. The shipper would fulfill it and translate that into a bill of lading for shipping purposes. We would then pick up a bill of lading and be responsible for the piece count and the pallet count and all that on that and deliver it to the receiver on a bill of lading, on a delivery receipt. And then weeks later, we were all pointing fingers at each other, trying to figure out why there were shortages, why there were differences, et cetera, et cetera. And that literally was millions of dollars a year in, in chargebacks. So um, we went down that path. Once we started doing this, this use case, we kind of went down the same familiar path, go back to 2017 and some of this uh, kind of early in the hype cycle, kind of before the big piece of the hype cycle here where I would describe most people as trying to monetize blockchain. They, would, they were trying to jump into that as step one. Um, and, you know, let's, let's treat it like the internet. Let's all get rich. Let's all work together, whatever the case may be. And um, we built our own global supply chain blockchain. And it works, again, at the time and still today. It's not, it's not yet fast. It's not yet scalable. It's not yet very mature. Um, and as I used to show on a slide in conferences, uh, it's boring and useless. Blockchain is boring and useless. And I got a lot of nervous laughter in blockchain conferences with that slide for a while. Um, but what it does, it does, does really well. And so where authenticity and provenance matter, we think it's going to be game changing. And as early as 2018, our founder and chairman, Fred Smith, basically said it's going to completely change worldwide supply chains. Um, and by 2019, our CIO came out and said, we actually think in this case, it's going to be open. And we think it's going to take a coopetition uh, to make this thing work. And so the problem is what we built and what we learned at that point in time, we realized very quickly that our competitors would not pay to use a FedEx solution or vice versa. So if that didn't work, what would work? Well, at the time, we realized that created a fork in the road. Most people were going down one side of the fork, which is this, let's monetize it, let's make money, let's get rich, let's whatever. And we realized that if you could hang an Apache or an MIT open license on the door frame of this kind of global and now virtual conference room, and everybody agreed to those set of rules before entering, it just scaled globally. So that took us down that path. And that led us to kind of blockchain as a team sport. And again, I later started referring to competition um, to develop the pro-competitive open source platform uh, on which we believe blockchain will be based. It also led me through that journey to have a full appreciation of the true luxury that I have because I work for a company that goes to 220 countries and territories. And at that level, there is no FedEx, there is no industry, and there are no borders. I mean, data knows no geographic borders. And because of that, my view from on this whole conversation is essentially from the International Space Station or more recently, um, a very proud thing from my point of view, this inspiration for St. Jude SpaceX, SpaceX mission um, just recently uh, with this giant cupola, this giant window um, where they could literally see the full perimeter of the earth. Why am I telling you all that? Because I think that's where we want to start this discussion. So how do we create sustainable supply chains? First of all, let's go all the way up and get that global view of supply chains and then we'll figure out how to make them sustainable or maybe more sustainable. The issue we were trying to deal with, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2017 involved just three parties, all of whom were essentially trying to work together. And yet we still spent millions on this issue. In the past couple of years, we've all had a front row seat to just how fragile a global supply chain actually is. Uh, and that continues and it will continue. What most people don't know, or maybe more likely to probably don't think about very often is that there are dozens and hundreds of steps in supply chains, frequently crossing oceans, taking months to move step-by-step step from raw material to end user. What we think of a supply chain is most often quite a few companies who are not only in different countries or in continents, but are also in completely different industries. You might be surprised to find out that a company may not even know they are part of a supply chain. 
So the three of us on this panel who are tasked with creating sustainable supply chains are off to a really slow start, right? It's a good thing my job here today is to explain how complex supply chains are and then let the other two on stage uh, tell you how to make them more sustainable. We're gonna stay up in that space, uh, that space view, that cupola view with this amazing view of the entire globe. And I'm gonna turn it over to Colonel Jim. So Jim, what do you see from this view and what do you wanna share? So, so I think one of the interesting things from this view is you can look down at the earth and you see this big blue sphere, but you, it's a big blue sphere because it's covered with water. And some of the features that still jump up at you are the lakes, the, the lakes, the rivers, and the ocean. And when you start thinking about, you know, what the significance of the lakes and the rivers were as we developed as a civilization, it's really around culture, commerce, and then governments. So if you can look to the Hindus River or any of the rivers in Europe or the Hudson or Mississippi in the U.S., culture sprung up around the river. Uh, commerce, you know, we have ships going up and down the river. And then governments, they use the rivers for borders or they use the rivers for protection, keep the invaders out. Today, those rivers are digital rivers. So as you said before, those rivers have no boundaries. So we look down and we can see the importance of having data flow and seeing the importance in culture. We have things like TikTok and Facebook and all these different ways that we deal with each other. Commerce, we have e-commerce today, we have digital commerce in the and that's the area we're in, you know, creating a way to push parts right to the point of use. And then governments, we have extra government things happening because of technology. We have, you know, people, companies making their own currencies, which is uh, fundamentally a governmental uh, requirement. The other thing we see from up in this view, I think, which is worth mentioning, is you can see the Great Wall of China. And what was that for? It was to keep invaders out. What does that mean in today's digital parlance? Well, it's really about how do I keep people from getting into my supply chain, my digital supply chain? You know, we talk a lot about cybersecurity, but the, the non de jure today, I think, should be data security. How are we going to secure that individual data pack as it moves? And one of the things that we've done here recently, we just received a contract from the U.S. Air Force, was to create a data fabric. And our part for the blockchain is to create the provenance of the data across that data fabric. And that's to keep those invaders out, to protect the pipe, so to speak, for the pipeline. So from my view, that's what I see is this transition from water and rivers the data flowing in these rivers. And again, having no boundaries and usurping some of the traditional roles of government. I'll pause there. Lost audio. Yeah, you might be muted. <clears throat> I'm muted, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I was clicking as fast as I could, my apologies. Tom, no pressure there, buddy. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the importance of trust in these supply chains and networks, how that connects into sustainability. And now we can start kind of going more down, down the sustainability piece. So thank you. Absolutely. So the, the way I like to think about this, if you, I think the problem in sustainability has shifted really significantly over the last 18 to 24 months. I think that if you rewind two years ago, the problem with making sustainable investments was a challenge around demand. They, I don't think consumers had mobilized in the same way they have today. And I don't think that companies had heard that consumer voice demanding sustainability. So I, I would say that two, three years ago, our challenge of sustainability was one of demand, that the demand for sustainable interventions in the supply chain otherwise weren't there. I think now we have demand. I think increasingly we have means and so much innovation going on in terms of how to supply, you know, whether it's green steel, whether it's green ammonia, whether it's, you know, whether it's, um, you know, trucks that, that are running off the solar grid. Um, yeah, the demand is there, the supply is there, but what we're lacking is trust. And so the, the key third leg to any market is how do I ensure that if I'm going to pay a premium for a good that is sustainably sourced, for a good that is sustainably manufactured, how do I ensure that I trust that I am actually receiving a good that is sustainably sourced or that I'm engaging with a set of partners that that um, that, that I trust? And I I, you know, if anyone listened to Corticon last week, so, so R3, you know, cre has created the, 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 the Corda, um, the Corda product, um, you know, a lot of the vocabulary that they use is around capital markets. And I, I would really encourage anyone who has some time to go listen, especially some of the opening sessions there, but the way that they talk about trust and moving, moving around this digital world is I think completely analogous and in tying back to James's um, to, to Jim's um, points earlier about, you know, the digital trust in the river, you know, we need to be able to connect the physical world of supply chains. I'll say, you know, capital markets have an easier job to do. We have to take a physical good and tie it to the digital good and ensure that those two remain distinct and ensure that as that good moves around a physical world, that we can continue to trust it. And so I think, you know, thinking first around, 
who are the actors in my supply chain and who are the actors that I need to engage with is absolutely the first thing you need to do. And then the next thing, once you understand and can define who those actors are in a way that we can trust, in a way that is verifiable, in a way that is credentialized, we then need to think about how to connect those actors to the goods that are moving around supply chain. So how do I trust that the, the good that this actor introduced into the supply chain is truly sustainably sourced or is sustainably manufactured. It wasn't, you know, I can't tell the difference between um, between a shirt that was produced in a way that respected human rights versus one that, that wasn't. I need to somehow establish that trust. And that's thinking about the challenges in supply chain, especially as it pertains to sustain, sustainability through that lens of trust. I think is a really important way to think about think about and and um, you know, how, how do you to to Jim's um, analogy how do you create the docks and get the boats on the river um, and, and ensure that you actually know what's what's moving up and down those waterways? Dale, I'll hand it I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, I, again, I I'm bouncing back and forth here between it feels to me like sustainability is an outcome um, of some of what we've all been talking about now for several years, which is once I create essentially a digital twin, if I think of FedEx kind of being, we, as we would describe it, we're kind of at this unique intersection of the physical and digital worlds. We've spent 50 years moving packages. And most people, if you ask about FedEx, they would tell you, oh, they move packages. I ordered something, they delivered it, whatever the case may be. But we think of ourselves as a technology company. And one of our three strategic pillars is to innovate digitally. And so this concept of a digital twin, uh, kind of a blockchain trusted digital twin, I think is the future of FedEx. If you think of what is FedEx moving forward, it's actually an and. It's not only a physical box, but it's also this digital from that point of view. And this, just the, the simple creation of that and the technology that will allow us to create that and to connect on an inter enterprise basis with this technology, with uh, peer to peer, uh, with smart contracts or whatever we're ultimately going to all call those things, um, uh, really starts changing. We've now kind of pivoted into the space where we can really take on something like sustainability. Because, you know, when I go back to the late 80s, when we first created the Malcolm Baldridge Award uh, in the U.S., uh, one of the people that won it was a company that we dealt with in the transportation space. And I would just remember how kind of shocking it was, which is they were starting to demand expectations from us as a downstream vendor, right? They prepared the product, but the extension of their delivery and of their customer experience basically involved a carrier moving it to, you know, their customer, right? And they were saying, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. Well, that's really what we're talking about now. Now we have the technology from a blockchain point of view to start pondering those things. Once we start connecting the dots, it not only addresses, Tom, the comments that you made, it also addresses the fact that that ABC company may not even realize they're part of a supply chain or that they have any expectations or anybody has any expectations for them. And um, even though e-commerce has kind of shortened that supply chain now a little bit where you can actually order something from the marketplace or from the manufacturer, or from the whatever, um, it's still a really complex thing. But now that we start getting data, now that we're starting to identify data, we're starting to create trust in this and rules and protocols around that. Once you get to that point, not only you're gonna get not only process improvement, but breakthrough, but I think that's where the sustainability piece starts coming into it as well. Now I know you, you know me, we have expectations of each other. Uh, we, we have accountability. We are essentially accountability partners to each other in certain things like this. And that's where we can really now start pivoting into sustainability and ethics and various things like that. So um, Jim, uh, beyond the supply chain discussion, how do you see tech kind of creating sustainment opportunities? Um, well, let me just reflect back a little bit on the supply chain, if I may, again. Sure. So, uh, you hit a couple, I, I think, really salient points. And, and one is, you know, this new type of uh, digital application of the supply chain. One of the things we like to say at Veritex is we've created a new modality of logistics where you can take a trusted digital asset and now move it to the point of use and manufacture it there. Um, what we found coming out of the pandemic is the last 10 to 15 years, companies have focused on lean. So they've leaned out their supply chains, their internal processes. When the pandemic hit, you know, we can all see today, my daughter, she's been fed chicken nuggets like four days this week at school because their supply chain in the cafeteria is broken or, you know, Ford's got all the, you know, trucks backed up in parking lots because they can't get chips. But by being, able to, by being able to create a digital supply chain and digital assets, you now have optionality where you can pivot. And I think that's one of the things that we're all learning coming out of this. 
and it's it's a it's a it's a unique way to do business because it really impacts the corporate operating margin. Traditional manufacturing companies were always burdened burdened with the cost of raw material and cost of production, but now if you're able to shift that to the point of use and you then absorb it at consumption, so it no longer rides on a balance sheet. So all of a sudden you start seeing this adjustment in operating margins, uh, requirements for cash flow, and so on. So that's some of I think the second and third order effects you see in the in the uh, B 2 C business. We've been consuming digital supply chain for a long time, right? On your iPhone, you buy an app, music, movie, and you consume it at the point of use. Um, think of that now in an industrial world. If you can move parts, what then enables that? It's that smart contract. It's that uh, blockchain for authenticity to be able to provide the trust in the in the parts. But we're now able to get outside those four walls of the factory. Um, I'll come back real quick to, to what you said. There's there's other applications in sustainment that I think are important as we start to, to look at the future. And one of them is, you know, how can you create something out of this tech that uh, is virtuous? Um, and I'll go back to cyberpunks or crypto kitties, all that. You know, 400, uh, $400 million market cap, cyberpunks, $3 billion market cap, for what? At the end of the day, you have a collectible, you know, uh, 64 pixels or something. Why not create these virtual cycles where you can create opportunities with tech in order to fund new projects, green tech, and so on. And that's one of the areas we've looked at. Um, we can come back and talk about it as we go, but it's a, a project we've been working on called the Salacia Project, which allows us to create a series of collectibles, um, allows us to use geotagging to incentivize people to come to events, whether it's you know clean the beach or um, clean the coral reef or whatever it might be. But it's, it comes out of a collectible series that generates revenue that we then push into blue tech and green tech type of things but it's allowing that tech to drive sustainability. In the course of one lifetime, one generation, we have totally corrupted the ocean, the, you know, these huge masses of uh, plastics and stuff. And here's, I'll, I'll close with this. The ocean's crying right now, Dale, and so are a lot of the other ecosystems, and we're not paying attention. We're expecting the government or somebody else to fix it. We have the tools today to start going out and doing things and becoming, to your analogy, a global citizen again instead of being co-opted and corrupted by this consumerism that uh, we've all been living with. I'll pause there because that's really heavy. Yeah, yeah, Jim, I'm going to loop right back to you for just a second, which is, I know you mentioned Veritex. I'm very familiar with that. I don't know how familiar the audience is, but I'd like them to be a little bit more familiar. And um, so give us, if you would, maybe a couple of minutes, two or three minutes on Veritex, the digitization, the digital, the some of that kind of stuff and what it does. So again, I'm I'm in an industry where we pick up and move packages, and that has been decades, right? So what's your fu- what's Veritex's future vision of that and connected to blockchain and intellectual property and and all those kinds of things? I, I'm I'm lobbing you a softball here, but I know you're going to knock it out of the park. I'll go back to some of the FedEx history. Uh, uh, in the early '80s, FedEx had a program, I believe it was called Zap. And it was it was too far advanced, you know the the technology the, mar- the technology and the market hadn't come together um, to or the technology and the need hadn't come together to create a market, right? And then all of a sudden, some other technology jumped out there and disrupted it, you know, a fax machine, that sort of thing. Go figure. But think about now you can take an object, right? That's a physical object, and you've created it in a digital world. So the world for me was three buckets. It's kind of a digital world, digitalization, and then creating value, so transformation out of digitalization, and being able to take that object now with provenance and move it outside of the four walls, so to move it across borders. And with take an aircraft part you, that's 3D printable. You can now move it to a 3D printer and manufacture point of use. The outcome is we're able to reduce lead times from 265 days down to six hours and, and so on. So there's a huge shift in what you can do. But beyond that, as I mentioned before, there's a huge shift to what your, uh, what your balance sheet looks like. You know, you get the downdrafts of having to maintain all this physical inventory all around the world. Um, it's disruptive. I mean, it's, it's disruptive for a company that their primary focus is to pick up that part and move it. So because you drive some of the non-value added costs and not a not a pejorative uh, dig at anybody. There's non-value ads. They're just a function of that's how you have to move it to get it right or store it or, or whatever. But if you can streamline this, you can create a, a what we think is a much more sustainable more optionality in the supply chain. And that's what Veritex is about. Um, but there's, you know, it's a big world and I'm never going to 3D print a banana so uh, or something like that. So there's, there's, there's plenty to put in trucks and planes and trains and all that sort of thing. And one of the things, <clears throat> before I turn it back over to Tom here, um, one of the things that I think of um, 
in the, you know, uh, once we get to uh, med devices and various things like that, once we can actually scale out um, Internet of Things tags, sensor-based logistics and various things like that, to speak back to what Jim just said, once I know where everything is, I won't need as much. Well, that's a hugely sustainable reference right there. Right now, there's a lot of people that have to do physical inventories of goods because they don't know where they are, right? Two times, four times a year, whatever the case may be, they come up with that. Once we know where everything is, think of an aircraft part, think of a med device, think, think of something likely on the expensive end on the front end of this thing, they will simply be able to do that. I mean, we worked a few years ago with a couple of companies that you would recognize. One made gaming systems and one was a retailer. And if you could track that all the way through that process, you don't have to do a physical inventory to say, I think I have four of these. You know you have two of these. One's in receiving and one's in electronics. And just the sheer notion of that gets you back into working capital, gets you back into inventories, it gets you back into distribution centers. And again, we may think of sustainability as kind of blue and green and things like that, but there's a lot of definitions of sustainability. And one of those would simply be the fact that I don't need as much product and I, I don't, I, it's not sitting around in warehouses, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this really does have ripple effects in a number of areas. So Tom, yeah. oh, go ahead. Let, let me just put back and I'm gonna be quiet. You know, you guys have a product Tron. So, you know, I, I believe, right? Your sensor, your IT sensor to tell you where things are at. So the, the key to Tron, I think when you look at it is you have to be able to provide data integrity into any of the things that we're talking about. So the piece that blockchain plays is it now can become that data security and that data integrity rail that you need so that you can then trust the block, you know, the blockchain and the information. So in order to get there, the tools we're building are essential. Um, I'll pause now, but I, I really think it's worth mentioning that, you know, again, we got to have the data integrity and that's the rail that we're providing um, with a blockchain. You guys are providing others. So. Correct. Thank, and thanks for the plug for that. Uh, Tom, uh, when do we, when we're going to start seeing some of these ideas driving impact in the markets, take us down kind of that path and wherever else you want to go at, around what we've just been talking about, if you would. Yeah. And that's probably the number one question we get, um, we hear in the market and we get from clients. And so I, I, I would certainly say the first wave, I mean, is, is here. And I think the first I'll break it up into a couple different things that we see moving actively now. I think the first is standards bodies, um, whether that's, whether that's textiles, whether that is in consumer goods or healthcare, right? All the different standards bodies and you know and, and non-industry bodies are moving in this space and attempting to find the standards book for data exchange and for how we're going to, again, I'm going to keep saying trust like a broken record, establish trust across these networks. I think the other place that we see a lot of mo movement right now is on the manufacturers. As a manufacturer, I'm going to invest many, many millions of dollars into greening my manufacturing processes. I need to make sure that I can guarantee that my product is, is certifiably green, sustainable for my, for my downstream consumer. And that's, that's not an easy problem to solve. Think about, think about something like um, a commodity chemical, an ammonia, a, a fuel that you know, is, is completely indistinguishable downstream. You know, thinking about how do we tokenize and prove that production process and the veracity of that and the quality of that production process to a downstream buyer so that I can actually be paid back for my investment. It's all about aligning incentives. Um, I think the third place we see it moving now are the, I think of the apex corporate buyers, the, um, the makers of um, whether it's a plane, a car, a, a data center, et cetera, who are working and using blockchain and establishing, bringing their suppliers onto networks to say, to make sure that they can prove both, you know, focusing first on authenticity and serialization of product, but that very naturally flows into sustainably. And finally, I'll hit on public sector where um, you know, we're working with the World Economic Forum now to establish a, a data exchange for to, to show the resiliency of supply chains in the developing world. And so imagine the, you know, the, the, the problem and the, the light bulb that we've had with the World Economic Forum is that there are private actors, whether it be FedEx, DHL, Coca-Cola, that, that hold lots of data around how these supply chains are, are behaving. And if that data were available to, to the, the organizations and the NGOs that are moving food, moving medical supplies, the cold chain through you know, Western Africa, Southern Africa, wherever, um, you know, the, that data would save thousands and thousands of lives if we're, if we're to should be shared. But at the moment, the technology exists for us to all trust. And so there's definitely a tie-in to confidence compute, a tie-in to you know, how do we share data and trust the veracity of data and aggregate data in a way that 
allows those companies to maintain their competitive edge in those markets. But you know, whether it's for humanitarian or even you think about benchmarking for other purposes so that we don't end up with another COVID-style disruption, um, you know, that, that notion of data aggregation, sharing, and confidence compute is, is something that's also you know, really growing legs in the market right now. Great. I want to go back <clears throat> one final comment to trust. And then as a, as a heads up to Mary, I've got two quick questions. Of, and then we're going to wrap up and I'll turn it back to you for Q&A in just a couple of moments. Um, I've spoken uh, uh, for several years now about what, you know, that whole blockchain as a team sport kind of thing caused me to really think about other ways of using words that we all think we know what that means. But trust is one of those words. Uh, for our entire lives, everybody here, trust is subjective, right? You are a doctor. I trust you. You're my lawyer. I trust you, whatever the case may be. And there's a bit of a leap of faith from that point of view. What we've really been talking about, what Tom just talked about is, is objective trust. I know that it's a Tom original. I know that it's a Jim original. We can prove it. We have data to prove it. We have this underlying almost MRI level view of data that I may not see all of it. I don't need to see all of it at FedEx. I'm going to see the logistics piece of that. But deep down underneath that, we get down to a digital fingerprint and an anchor from Tom selling something to Jim. Uh, in Jim's case, it could be 3D printed, but there's still going to be an anchor. There's still going to be some ability to say Tom sold something to Jim and Jim didn't print six of them. Um, he printed one of them or whatever the case may be. But this objective trust is going to change so many things about now it's simply going to be there. So, you know, the, the younger brothers or sisters of the students at University of Arkansas right now, you know, 10 years from now, they may never hear the word blockchain. It just simply is a layer under everything. And they'll, they'll have those kinds of things. So I'm going to tee up two final questions here. Um, and bear with me for just a second, audience, if you would. But we just brought uh, let's just think of it this way. We just brought Jim and Tom back from the future with a focus on sustainable supply chains. Uh, I want each of you to share with the audience what may or may not be obvious to us at this point, but what you see as inevitable uh, with a nod to Kevin Kelly's book, Jim and I, we were talking about that earlier, which is the inevitable. Um, so I'm going to start with Jim here, but Jim, what's obvious, what, what's inevitable to you that may not quite be yet obvious to us on, and you can go anywhere you want on this, you know, this, this topic. I think what's inevitable is um, when we look to the future, the future is going to have many more blockchain solutions unmoored for cryptocurrency. I think really letting the genie out of the bottle is a reference back to homage back to Kevin Kelly is really when we unmoored cryptocurrency from blockchain. We're going to open up, you know, the decentralization of X. What could X possibly be? We're also going to have trust like we've never had before outside of the four walls of the factory. That's going to create whole new different business models, whole new different opportunities, whole new different sustainment type of uh, uh, opportunities. And to your, to your comment, I wear a mechanical watch made by a company called Bremont. It's got all kinds of gears and dials and everything else. I quite frankly don't care how that works. But when I look at the face of that watch, I need to trust that that's the right time, right? And that's the era we're in right now. We need to be able to transition from being able to watch the gears to be able to watch the hands on the walls. And as you said, blockchain will become a general purpose technology. We won't talk about it anymore. That's what the future looks like. Excellent. Thank you. So what may not be obvious to us, but is inevitable to you, Tom, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I love the fact that, it, that blockchain disappears in the background. It's almost like we're sitting in 1998 and geeking out about the TCP IP protocol, how that, you know, this great way to exchange packets is going to change the world, which sort of misses the point. That just works now. But I, I'm going to jump into the corporate side. You know, the, the big players in corporate IT systems, your SAP, your Oracles, your Dynamics, your you know, Salesforce, <laughs> You know, all those players right now are trying to figure out what to do with, with this space. And I think what you'll see is a move towards interoperability that as, you know, I, if I'm connecting, I'm running SAP, I'm going to be able to connect into this network and this, you know, it's going to be a network of networks. So I think you'll start to see this emergence of connecting to those trusted data sources, and then you'll see a ton of innovation at the glass um, from those providers and from and new entrants. There's absolutely an opportunity for you know, the, the next SAP, the next Salesforce to move here, but there's gonna be a ton of innovation on the different use cases and value and, and value added services that can be provided because you now have access to all the state, because you can trust the, the genealogy, because you can see all the way back um, through the supply chain. So that's my, that's my, that you're gonna see, you're gonna see these, these big players you're going to see a wave of innovation at the glass for for corporations in their in their IT systems. Excellent. Thanks to both of you. So one final quick question. We'll do this in maybe a moment or so, Mary, and we'll turn it back over to you. 
Um, so first, Jim, how can this audience help us move uh, forward toward more sustainable supply chains? What can they, what, what's the takeaway or what's the call to action for them on this topic? I think the call to action is really, it's time to start looking at where these advances in technology are leading us and how we can use them to, to again, better our world um, and become global citizens. So we're, we're still stuck in this becoming a consumer. We need to move beyond that and start realizing there's a finite number of resources in the world and uh, we should cherish them. Uh, you know, every year more species go extinct than actually went extinct when the dinosaurs were struck. That should bother all of us. Same with foresting, same with the oceans and so on. So let's take these technologies and let's really make a more sustainable world. Great, Tom, I'm teeing you up for the finish here. So how can this audience help us move forward toward more sustainable supply chains? The, fir the first thing that I would jokingly, sort of joke, come join us at Accenture, um, especially you students, we'd love to have you. Um, we, uh, but I, I'll put that aside. I think, I think it's, it's consumer action. And I, while we have to move beyond consumers, beyond our roles as consumers, you know, uh, behaving out in the market and buying sustainably, buying and using, taking advantage of this trust, right? Being a consumer that buys on these notions of trust is is absolutely, absolutely it. Um, and uh, I, I welcome any reach outs if you want to come join us at Accenture too. My final little plug. Yeah, I would add my coopetition comment, which is I, I started using that around blockchain, but we actually saw that happen in real time about 18 months ago in the pandemic where where you and I might be arguing over the back fence about our favorite sports team. And then all of a sudden we dropped everything. It's not about where we compete, it's about where we can agree. And in that moment, and we saw that at 9-11 as well, uh, for a moment where all of a sudden, none of that mattered, right? We all dropped everything. We were trying to move PPE around the world to people that we will never meet, we never did meet. And it was for the right reasons. And I think that a lot of companies have uh, focused, and rightly so, and I think Jim mentioned this on the lean side of things, we focused within our four walls, right? But this is an inter enterprise discussion. And I think a big opportunity, even though I it wasn't traditionally taught at business school, I know Mary teaches it there and others do now, uh, or on your first day of work, but how do I work with my competitor? How, is that an opportunity and what can we do? And that gets us to this broader, almost commons approach around all these technologies, whether this is blockchain, which leads us to more sustainable solutions, et cetera, et cetera. So we do play in a big space. And that's the one of the lessons I've learned is, you know, we, we play in this international space. And at that level, all kinds of things are possible. So Mary, again, thank you to Tom. Thank you to Jim. Appreciate it very much. Mary, I'm going to turn it back over to you for Q&A if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Well, I need all three of you with, with me. So I just want to share a couple of reflections of my own, and then we're going to go to the, the audience Q&A. Uh, one of the sound bites you all said I completely agree with, that in a few years we're not going to talk about blockchains. In fact, when the governor founded us three years ago, I had told uh, Matt Waller, our dean, I'm like, this name is only going to be hot for a couple years, and then we need to either pivot to something like Internet 3.0 or digital ecosystems. Because uh, it, you know, it is just going to be the underlying um, layer that helps us all just kind of validate that we're all agreeing and seeing to the same sequence of events. So I agree with you on that. The second thing, I, my second comment is, I think you three are so much more braver than I am. The fact that you will make inevitable predictions, <laughs> I just think it's so brave. I think I said a couple minutes ago that when people ask me about the future, I always say I don't know because I really believe it's emergent based on the choices we make today. So um, I wanted to compliment you on your, on your bravery. All right, are you all ready for some questions from the audience? Okay, I gotta put sure. my glasses on for this. Okay, I love this one, and I hope all three of you ask this question, uh, answer this question. Can you talk about how granular you think the tracking of you know, products and services will be? Um, so is it, is it down to you know, products like this? Is it a pallet level? How granular will tracking be? Jim, you wanna start with that one? Yeah, I mean, we can, uh, granular level and, you know, the manufacturing side goes all the way back to the raw material, right? So, so if you go all the way back to, the, to when the powder's made or when the, when the bar stock's made or whatever, that's because that's what you need to know. And you need to know it because at the end of the day, if there's a form fit function or some sort of failure, you have to be able to do the reverse forensics. So the real value is being able to create these data lakes and pools at a granular level that allows you to dip in very quickly so you don't have to say to FedEx, I need you to ground all your seven, six, sevens. 
right? I only needed to go after these four because I didn't know they were made with this powder batch that we suspect is poor. So being able to do that will create all kinds of opportunities. Tom? Yeah, I think it really depends. And I think that making sure you're focusing in, especially at this early stage of the technology, on the specific use case you're solving for is absolutely <laughs> critical. Um, you know, I, I think of it, it could be a serialized part if that's what you care about. It could be a batch if you're thinking about like foods and agri. It could be, you know, even, you know, sometimes it's not about the, the individual object. Like when I, I mentioned earlier, sort of the sort of a, a green commodity and just needing, if you're going to put a hundred, you know, if I'm, if I'm making sustainably produced ammonia, I put into a vat, it doesn't really matter for that use case. So back to the, you need to know the use case that I'm now getting green ammonia. I just need to make sure that the premium I'm paying for green ammonia is going back to an actual sustainable production. So I would say it, it depends all the way from, it can vary from a serialized object all the way through to, I don't really care about the individual product itself to get the outcome I want. So remaining focused on business case and where, where you're getting value and what problem you're trying to solve is, is key to that. Yeah, I would add, uh, uh, I know you've got a health pass thing and Mary, you and I have talked about this and your work and, and knowledge uh, is continuing to, to increase and focus in that space. But I would argue right now that the vaccine pass that I was handed when I got my vaccine doesn't actually prove anything. I mean, it, it's a piece of paper, it's a card that has my name and it says Pfizer, whatever the case may be. But increasingly, we're requiring that to get back into society. Companies are now saying you have to, you have to be vaccinated, et cetera, or certain rules before you work here. And so um, back to your, I'll, I'll stick with vaccine as an example. The fact is that technology exists and that's what we're here talking about, not only in this panel, but today, the broader conference today, that will allow us to connect it all the way back to the Moderna, Pfizer, J&J, &J, fill in the blanks, whatever the case may be, the raw material that Jim talked about. And I don't need to know that as FedEx. I just need to know the logistics piece of that. But if you think of this data as an MRI level view, from my point of view, it may, it may get to the carton or the pallet or, or a container, whatever the case may be. But as it drills further down, those dots are actually going to connect. That's the trust that Tom's been talking about and we've been talking about. It's going to connect all the way down to the fact that Jim made this and here's the crypto anchor or the anchor or the digital fingerprint or whatever it's being referred to as all the way to include intellectual property and margins and pricing and all kinds of things. And then at a higher level of that, it may actually be combined into a box or a pallet, move across the border, et cetera, et cetera. But we're now in a position to take that little vial and say this vial, uh, we'll call him Vinny, Vinny the vial. He's now been added to five other little vials and then been in a bigger box and a bigger box in a pallet and moved across. But when you strip that back down, that forensic piece that, Tom, that Jim talked about, we'll now be able to prove that my vaccine came out of that specific vial and tie it all the way back up. And that, that connectivity, that gets you to this anti-counterfeiting and it gets you, uh, it pushes away from the gray market, the black market, the all kinds of things where that's gonna happen. And it gets you the authenticity of, it is actually that vial from that manufacturer. And that's the level. I may not see all that data. I don't need to see your margins or your pricing when I'm moving it. I simply need to be able to connect it. But all those dots are gonna connect in this kind of an MRI level view. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna combine a couple questions because uh, the audience has asked several about regulation. So let me, just, um, let me just pitch this to you. Okay, data knows no borders, but regulatory compliance does. How do you handle the many regulations with a globally distributed supply chain? Let me jump on that one if I could. We've worked, we've done a couple of use cases early use cases, proofs of concept with U.S. Customs. Uh, we have a very close relationship with them as would any big carrier like ours. And it's simply, you know, a peer, it's a colleague, right? We have to, we, we actually challenged U.S. Customs in 2019 to mandate blockchain on the horizon. Just that, that would force all of us to come to the table and work on it together from that point of view. We can't wait for them to do it and they can't wait for us to do it. So the answer is we have to work on it together. And we're currently working with them in an e-commerce example where when I order something from, you know, Reganer.com, that first entity would be required to make an anonymized link available of certain information to include country of origin. That's, that's really what they want. They want to know, first of all, is it, is it already in the U.S. or is it not? If it's not, that takes it down a different path. But 
the data that we just now talked about in the last couple of moments is exactly the way it's managed. And by the way, U.S. Customs has an almost identical view that we do on the horizon. They have a 21st century customs framework that is digital. They understand it. They understand the need for that. They understand that their systems aren't currently built that way because the technology didn't used to exist when they built some of the systems they have. So they get it and they understand it. Uh, we've worked with World Customs, World Economic Forum. I mean, the, the broader entities, World Trade, they all have research papers out there that say blockchain is going to completely change worldwide supply chains in the next 10 or 15 years. And so I don't, I, it's not us persuading them at this point in time. It's more this coopetition. It's more working with them and broadening, pulling our own blinders back to be able to say, look, this is a global opportunity. How do we work on this together? And so Dale, think about that port of entry when you buy an e-commerce package. It comes in, so now you have an opportunity to inspect it. But in a digital world, using a digital supply chain, where's the digital port of entry, right? So how do they have an opportunity to tell that this server farm is in uh, Arizona that this digital file is held on that's now being pushed? How do you keep your enemy from attacking your digital supply chain? How do you even see that he's doing that, right? So right. one of the things I've talked to U.S. Customs about is creating some sort of digital port of entry. That's a huge challenge if you're going to start moving parts around the world. We have regulations like ITARs that prevent us from shipping stuff to you know, Iran or to uh, sensitive material to China or to North Korea. You know, how do you do that in this digital world? The blockchain providence actually, believe it or not, makes it more secure. Instead of, you have those same regulations, I put something in a box, I ship it to a first point down in Miami, they rebox it, ship it somewhere else, and now all of a sudden it ends up in, in Iran, all right? It's happened many times. But with that digital world, being able to create a prescribed workflow so that I know it has to go to, to, uh, to Dale, and because of a verifiable key exchange or a verifiable identification, nobody else can jump in the middle and take that digital file, right? So now all of a sudden, you've actually created a more secure world, which is counterintuitive. It's a world that you can't monitor at that port of entry, but you're going to have to monitor it through the full um, through the full value chain. I'll pause there, but it's a it's a different world. And Not just right do work. And engage, engage, and engage. Right, reach out. Don't don't view it as a like they, they are partners, the regulators in in all of this. So engage, engage, and engage more would be my final. Well, well, thank you because uh, you know one of my sound bites about regulators is I don't want to live in an unregulated world. As a consumer, I want to be protected. As an investor, I want to be protected. So we just, you know, I loved your talking points about engaging and working with regulators. And I know a little story about you too, Jim, <laughs> All right? What did you do at the Department of Defense to get them to adapt regulations for 3D printing? Tell the audience that little story. Well, there was a, in electronics, there's a Buy America clause in the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations. And it's to prevent counterfeit and to prevent some other things uh, getting into the supply chains that are critical to our our weapon systems and our national security. Uh, I simply took that clause and everywhere it put electronics, I substituted in 3D printed. And I went out to the staffers at the HASC, the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee and said, hey, counterfeit's a big, a counterfeit uh, with 3D printing is gonna become a big deal, right? Traditionally, counterfeit parts were uh, low complex parts, washers, fasteners, that sort of stuff. With 3D printing, you can make anything. You can scan a print. You can make a hell of a good replica, but it's really not a duplicate of a part because it may not have the material properties. So by doing that, we uh, got them to put in the uh, in the defense appropriations bill the, a question back to the DOD on how you will mit uh, mitigate counterfeit parts in your supply chain. Then we went back to the DOD and we said, hey, we've got this blockchain solution that will help you mitigate parts in your supply chain. So creating regulation or creating some sort of inquiry from Congress is one way to set market. The other is to get a law, which is much more difficult, especially in those days they hadn't really defined what blockchain was. But you can see where you can come together, work together in order to come up with a solution. There's high consequence of failure in our national security as there is in an airplane, as there is in space. Um, but you got to make sure that you have a trusted supply chain to work. And that means having authentic parts. Back to what uh, Tom said, you got to engage, engage, engage. Mary, let me jump in for a second on a follow up to that. And you and I've talked about this, which is I think one of the key takeaways me hearing what Jim just now said translates into what I'm working on, which is we've spent a lot of years, I, I would say we've wasted a lot of years focusing on who, what, and when of blockchain, who FedEx, uh, when, you know, what blockchain, when, we're all trying to figure that out. 
and not as much time figuring out the why. And so you and I are familiar with this topic, but I'll, I'll give you 30 seconds on it basically to connect that. Why I think gets us into the C-suite, why gets us into the business use cases. And that's what's brilliant about what Jim just now said. He didn't come back and say, well, let me explain to you how this blockchain technology works. He simply said, we're trying to get to anti-counterfeit. I have a solution for you. And it happens to use something that you may not be familiar with, but here's the way that works. That's where we are, I think, in the C-suite right now as well, which is don't try to walk in there and explain to them what blockchain is. Approach it from their point of view. If a CFO needs to reduce average days outstanding, we can have a smart contract discussion where you could get from a net 40 to a net zero, right, and a micropayment, or, 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 whatever the case may be. And I think that's brilliant that he took that approach. But I want the audience to, to pull the blinders back and realize that's exactly where we need to be in business right now as well, I believe. Okay, great. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, I got a tough question for you now, if you're ready. So um, if you were in financial services, it's very clear that you can see things like DeFi is already threatening business models for traditional financial services. You're all very optimistic about using blockchains to help supply chains, but how could blockchains actually threaten business models for large you know, logistics companies like FedEx or Tom, you, you help with many of your large clients. Where is the threat, not just the opportunity? I'll, I'll jump in by just simply saying peer-to-peer -peer technology. What value do I provide? I should look in the mirror and come up with that. It's not a preachy point to me or you or the audience, but if, if, if I need Jim to introduce me to Tom, that gets you to ride sharing apps, that gets you to, I need to rent a home or rent a thing for the weekend. There's a ton of examples. There's industries built on the fact that I need Jim to introduce me to Tom. Well, in a peer to peer scenario, if, if, if I need a ride um, and somebody has a vehicle and we can find each other in a trusted environment, that disrupts a ton of industries right there. And so that's one of the reasons why I always say, if you heard the FedEx guy say it's not very fast or scalable or mature yet and you stopped listening, you missed a really big point, which is, however, where authenticity and provenance, what, what it does, it does really well. And so you need to be aware of that, especially if you sit between supply and demand right now, you need to be prepared to be to either disrupt or be disrupted because your world's going to change, I think, um, sooner rather than later. Yeah, it, it's it, it's all about looking for those the, you know, the disintermediation play, right? And then, you know, putting a different word into your, into your talks right there, Dale. I think the other one, I think just very generally blockchains and kind of this idea of shared trust, and it, it's going to reduce friction for market entry. So I think like, like, you know, this, this applies to any, any digital, any digital revolution, I think. And if I had that million dollar idea, I, I'd probably be on a different, on a different panel or on a, like I, I don't know what the idea is going to be, but there's going to be someone who figures out how to use this technology to move faster. Um, there is a bit of a hedge in the physical supply chain world, right? You still need to put a facility in place to build something, but to, you know, Jim's points, you know, the, the, you know, additive manufacturing and 3D printing kind of have broadly reduced, reduced those, those barriers. So I, I wish I had the, the million dollar idea, um, but I, I think that very broadly, it does reduce friction in the way that a lot of these digital um, disruptions have over the last, you know, a couple of decades. And Mary, I would add value, value, value. Uh, so if we create the value, we're going to create the disruption. The, bit, the hardest part, when I'm working, you know, uh, we, the government's got a very mature workforce. Uh, and when I'm working with a government workforce, um, you know, you've got to show them where there's value. We're going to make their job easier for them to adopt this technology because they're used to doing whatever they're doing, whatever they're successful with today. So if you can't prove that there's value either to the corporation or all the way down to the individual, and oh, by the way, you've created a very simple UI and interface for them because you don't want to throw complexity over this. You won't be able to disrupt. But so the threats are not being able to have a very proper value statement that will then inspire somebody to stop what they're doing because the world functions today in supply chain, right? And the last point I'll go to Tom, uh, this, in, uh, this uh, intermediation. When I originally started this in 2015, I thought the whole world would be changed and everybody, all the middlemen would go away. That never happened. What really happened was we started to redefine their roles because there's still something to do with relationships that as human beings, we still value those relationships and nurturing them. So we won't totally get rid of and totally disintermediate supply chain and get rid of freight forwards or whatever that piece may be that we have to take out. But what we're going to do is we're going to fundamentally redefine what their role is 
And really, what does that mean? It's really we're going to fundamentally redefine where their value is. So follow the value, 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 value. Well, with that, gentlemen, I want to say I value, value, value my relationships with you and with your companies. And so I want to thank you so much for, um, for being our lead in conversation today. I hope you're able to hang around. I hope you can interact with some of our audience members on Brella. They asked so many more questions than I could get to in our time allotted. So um, I want to say, again, thank you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it very sure. much. Jim and Tom, great work. Thank you very much. I was proud to share the stage. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks, Brent. Okay, so for our audience, we are ready for you to go answer our blockchain trivia game, and then we'll be back in a bit with our next conversation.